Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our Wednesday high energy seminars. So before we start, just want to say this meeting is being recorded. I'm sure you're all aware, but according to new SI guidelines, we have to say this explicitly. So this recording is be, uh, this um, seminar is being recorded. And if you would rather not have your face recorded, please turn off your video. Um, all right. So let's get started. We have two wonderful speakers lined up today. Our first speaker is Dr. DJ Pasham. He earned his PhD from the University of Maryland College Park in 2014, working on X-ray and optical time series analysis, analysis of uh, ULXs. Um, from 2014 to 2016, he was a postdoctoral associate at NASA Goddard uh, Space Flight Center, after which he moved to MIT as an Einstein Fellow in 2016. There he has been working on tidal disruption flares and has been involved with NICER and as of 2019 is a research scientist. So please take it away. Great, thanks. Good afternoon everyone and uh, thanks for having me. So in my talk today, I will tell you about multivalent uh, monitoring observations of stellar tidal disruption events. Specifically, I'll focus on accretion states and what they can tell us about um, these systems. So the focus today will be on one specific object for the most part that we've been tracking for the last uh, two years using different X-ray telescopes, um, optical, and also radio data. So my goal today is to trying to convince you that um, there are these accretion states in tidal disruption events and you can use them uh, to tease out important information about supermassive black holes. So the majority of the work um, has been submitted and it's in this archive reference if you're interested to look at it. Okay, so as I said, the topic for today is stellar tidal disruption events or TDEs. These are electromagnetic flares that come from nuclei of external galaxies. They are encounters between stars and supermassive black holes. What essentially happens is a star comes too close to a massive black hole and the tidal shear across the length of the star exceeds the self-gravity of the star. That's when the star gets shredded as shown in this cartoon here. Uh, roughly half of the material falls onto the black hole and triggers the process of accretion onto the, the black hole that was otherwise hidden or dormant. And the natural excitement with these uh, events um, uh, is for several reasons. One, as you probably already know, most of the supermassive black holes in the universe we think are hidden at centers of galaxies. They're not actively accreted. So TDEs allow us to tap in or sample from that huge population of hidden supermassive black holes. As you can see in this cartoon, they allow us to um, do a clean sort of study of accretion um, without any pre-existing stru structures like in the case of AGM. Some of these TDEs also launch jets, they launch uh, disk outflows, and they can also form X-ray corona. Uh, all of these are really important, energetically important um, physical entities around black holes that uh, need further investigation are very mysterious right now. We can also use TDEs to measure spins of supermassive black holes, uh, which I will briefly talk about at the end of the uh, presentation. So these are some of the things that we can do with TDEs. The list is actually bigger, but these are the things that are relevant to what I'll be talking about today. So left side is the same thing, the list of things that we can do. Um, but in order to turn TDEs into precise probes of supermassive black holes, having some sort of an observational framework is extremely valuable. It would be really nice to know when should we point Chandra, for example, to get um, a, to increase the chances of detecting an outflow. When should we point radio telescopes to um, identify the formation of the jet? When should we point new star to detect reflection, um, iron reflection and measure the spin of the black hole. So having some sort of an observational framework helps us identify the right times um, to uh, get more insights about the system. And people who've been studying stellar mass black holes going into outburst for several decades now, more than four decades, they um, have a system for this. They have defined something called accretion states uh, for individual, uh, super, uh, individual stellar mass black holes as they evolve through their outburst. So let me briefly remind everyone what, what I'm talking about here in terms of accretion states. 
uh, at least what we know from stellar mass black holes. Shown here uh, on the left side is a cartoon of a stellar mass black hole accreting from a companion star. Most of the time, these systems are quiescent, very low levels of accretion, um, low levels of uh, flux. But every now and then, they can go into these huge outbursts where the overall emission increases by several orders of magnitude compared to the quiescent level. And what's really interesting is most of these systems, when they go through this outburst, they have um, a characteristic behavior, simple, um, not simple, but a very um, template behavior, I should say, which is what I'm trying to depict here in a simplified uh, cartoon here. On the left side, I'm showing you the flux versus time of a typical stellar mass black hole going into an outburst. So we can understand the outburst in terms of two physical components near the black hole. So we think there is an accretion disk, some sort of an inner accretion flow, and we think there is a corona in the, in the immediate surroundings around the stellar mass black hole. So they start off from quiescence by being hard. And what that means is the X-ray spectrum is dominated by hard X-rays more than 3 keV, for example. And as they rise, go somewhere near the peak, they transition into something called a soft accretion state, where the overall X-ray emission is dominated by soft X-rays, meaning less than 2 keV. And then as the accretion rate drops, they transition back into the hard state, where the corona, which is emitting the hard X-rays, dominates, and then eventually they move back into the quiescent state. The same thing can be um, understood in the form of flux versus hardness, the so-called hardness intensity diagram, where again, the source rises from quiescence, hard, and then gets into the soft state, hard state, and back into quiescence. And what's really important to notice here is that the transition between these accretion states happen on timescales of hours or tens of hours in case of stellar mass black holes. Now, if you were to scale that to supermassive black holes, um, and assume linear scaling uh, because viscous time scales scale linearly with mass, um, then you would find out that uh, these transitions in AGN, for example, would take hundreds or even thousands or tens of thousands, depending on the mass of the black hole. So that's the reason we think we're not able to see uh, multiple state transitions in single AGN. Uh, there is an exception to the risk, this rule. There are so-called changing look AGN. Um, and if you're interested, please have a look at these references. But TDEs, on the other hand, they experience a wide range in mass accretion rate. They go from essentially no accretion um, to super Eddington or maybe near Eddington, and then go back into the quiescent state. So this should, in principle, allow us to trace all these accretion states if they exist around supermassive black holes. That brings us to um, the source that I'll be spending a lot of time today, which is the TDE AT2018 FIK, or Assassin 18 UL, as it was discovered by the Assassin Sky Survey. On the y axis, I'm showing you the bolometric luminosity, on the x axis, the time. And uh, the first thing to note is that uh, the overall evolution is not smooth. It's not a simple power law decline as predicted by analytical theory. There's a lot of variability, which I'll be talking about shortly, uh, but also um, 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 there's variability at early times as well. Um, and then another important thing to note is the time scale here. This is roughly about two years of time that uh, we spend a lot of energy and time tracking the source. So the first thing we did was to check and make sure this is a genuine TDE and not some sort of uh, an AGN uh, doing some weird thing. So shown here in black is the normalized spectrum of the host galaxy after the, the flare had finished. And yellow is a template fit of a galaxy, and blue is the, the residual here. So what's what's important thing to note here is that there are no Asian lines, and this seems to be a genuine uh, dormant supermassive black hole that went into an outburst at TDE. And another important thing that you get from a host galaxy is the sigma velocity broadening, and that gives us uh, a mass estimate, which is important for all the things that I'll be mentioning uh, in the coming slides. So this gives us a mass of something like 50 million solar masses. Now the thing to note is for a 50 million solar mass black hole, the accretion disk peaks in the UV. 
as opposed to for stellar mass black holes, the accretion disk is in the soft X-rays and the corona is in the hard X-rays. So here, similar to the hardness ratio of stellar mass black holes, in, in this particular 50 million stellar mass black hole, you can track the so-called hardness ratio by defining this alpha OX, which is simply the UV to X-ray spectral index, where UV is again the disk and then the two to 10 keV is the corona. So based on that, we can, um, um, we can take the alpha OX and plot it against the um, luminosity of the source. And what we find is that there are you know, distinct clusters um, where the source starts off in the top left here, evolves into the soft state near peak, comes into the hard state and goes back into the quiescence. And these are the predictions um, made by, for example, Soblevska, um, who I believe is at CFA. So again, this is very similar to the harness intensity diagram of uh, stellar mass black holes, except it's inverted now. Now, same thing, you can look at the light curves and make uh, a similar uh, conclusion. In the black, I'm showing you the X-ray flux and in green is the UV flux, which is the disc and the corona. So initially, as you can see, the UV is dominating, which is the disc. And at late times here, the X-rays are dominating, which is similar to this plot on the right here. So just to give you, uh, you know, finish off on that thought, left side is the same schematic I showed you from a stellar mass black holes, except on the right side now, things have been inverted. Um, I apologize for this because this is not my choice. This is how apparently people do it in the, in the Asian community. So that's the reason I've adopted that uh, style here. So here, what we're seeing is we have found the source in a soft state because presumably we missed this rise because we did not capture the TDE's rising part of it. We saw the hard state and eventually um, saw the quiescent state. So we sampled three states and the individual transitions between them. So the second thing we found is that if you take the X-ray spectrum and track it over this 500, 600 day period, there is a clear um, increase in the hard X-rays as a function of time. Initially, there were no hard X-rays, meaning the corona was virtually you know, absent. It was not even um, at zero essentially. And then as the source evolves into the so-called hard state, the overall power law fraction or the corona's contribution to the X-ray flux increases as a function of time and at some point begins to even dominate the overall emission. Uh, same thing can be seen as a ratio of two to 10 keV luminosity over the bolometric luminosity. So initially, essentially no contribution from the two to 10 keV, but at late times is really dominating the overall emission. A third piece of evidence is the power density spectrum. So shown in blue here is the power density spectrum um, of the soft state. And then in red and green are the power density spectra from the hard state. But the green and red are assuming two different priors. But the important point here is that in the hard state, most of the extra variability comes from the fastest time scales, which is on the order of few tens of minutes. And for a 50 million solar mass black hole, that corresponds to um, a few RG to few tens of RG. And with the soft state, most of the variability comes from the uh, longest time scales. So the short time scale variability is absent, meaning something compact has formed in the hard state. The same thing can be seen from XMM light curves, which sample much shorter time scales. So here again, the soft state, or maybe the, the transition between soft and hard state, where you see essentially no variability on time scales of minutes, but in the hard state, you see rapid variability on thousand second time scale. So based on these three uh, independent lines of evidence, one is uh, the hardness intensity diagram or the alpha OX diagram, the spectral evolution and the timing, uh, we argue that we have found three independent states and two transitions in this TDA. One caveat, however, is in hard states of stellar mass black holes, you expect there to be a radio jet, but we uh, did take radio observations with ATCA and did not find any jet. 
which is kind of surprising. And you're not clear why that is the case. But in the paper, we argue, um, maybe we just, we don't argue, but we just suggest that maybe um, it's the lack of magnetic flux um, that is not allowing this to launch yet, perhaps. So as I said, three lines of evidence to um, suggest that we are seeing something similar to stellar mass black holes. We are seeing the same accretion states, soft, hard, and quiescent, um, and, uh, and the same pattern of behavior as stellar mass black holes, except now we have a black hole that is 10 to seven times uh, bigger than a, than a stellar mass black hole. So what can we do with these accretion states? First, as I said, um, I've already showed this plot. It shows nicely the evolution of the X-ray corona around the supermassive black hole. Um, in typical AGN, uh, you don't get to see this. You don't get to see the formation of X-ray corona. Here, um, we are able to actually track in real time um, how the corona is evolving as a function of time. Um, there were a lot of gaps in the data. We weren't sure what was happening when the data was um, coming in. So maybe in the future, we can be more systematic and more strategic in terms of X-ray and radio observations uh, right at the beginning of formation of corona to really pin down what are the conditions for performing a corona. And the second thing is the X-ray spectrum of a lot of AGN, they have something called soft excess. There is a thermal component that is kind of mysterious. It's not known what causes the soft excess. Some people believe it's the accretion disk and some believe it's something else. And the same plot actually gives us how the soft excess is evolving as the power law uh, corona is coming up. So in the future, again, you know, as more and more systems can be tracked, we can figure out what this soft excess is that is present essentially in all AGN. And here is an X-ray spectrum of uh, 8020, 18F5K in the hard state. And if you just fit a disk and a power law, you see a clear excess. And instead, if you try to fit that excess with a relativistic iron line reflection, you can estimate a lower bound on the spin. Um, so in the future, hopefully we can have like a new star observation in the hard state, and that can give us a better constraint on, um, on spins of these uh, supermassive black holes. So I think 802018K uh, is just the beginning. There was a lot of time and energy invested, but I think in the end, we demonstrated that there are these accretion states and you can use these accretion states to, to tease out some uh, important information from these systems. NICER is another um, soft X-ray telescope that has been observing several TDEs for the last uh, couple of years. Uh, it's a mission based out of uh, Goddard and uh, I'm part of the OSWG, sorry, um, Observatory Science Working Group. And uh, we've been putting in um, a lot of time uh, on several TDEs. One such TD that we've spent a lot of time is AT2020 OCN discovered in 2020. Um, for anyone who works on TDEs, this kind of data is just unprecedented. So each point here is a visit um, by uh, NICER. So you're looking at multiple visits by NICER every day for the last 200 days. Um, NICER has invested a huge amount of time on this and there's in some interesting results coming out of this. So this is the same plot I'm showing you in log scale now, um, you know, just to give you a sense of this wide variability that NICER is able to capture. Another really interesting thing that has come out of this data set is if you model uh, the time resolved spectra of this source, you can see that there's actually two thermal components in there. One is the warm thermal component whose temperature is changing between 50 to 150. And there's one that is constant thermal component. Uh, and for the last couple of months, uh, this warm one is actually steadily going up in time. So we think uh, this could probably turn into a corona, so we're keeping a close eye on it. Using deep uh, XMM spectra of this source, um, we've been able to fit a TDE slim disk model um, that has been developed by uh, the Arizona group, Ven et al. And we are already able to get some estimates on the spin of the black hole in 80-20-20 OCN to be something like greater than 0.87. Um, so in summary, multi-level monitoring of TDEs, I think can give us really important insights. Uh, first thing is it can provide us this framework of identifying accretion states. 
uh, we've demonstrated at least in this case that um, you know there are these equation states that you can use um, and then as i said the equation states can also be used to understand um, corona soft x's and measure black hole spins hopefully when more and more of these will be detected in the future uh, we can start to build up spin distributions of massive black holes but the key and really important point to make is you need monitoring just having one observation a month or you know every couple of months is just not enough to to get this insight so yeah thank you Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Uh, we already have some questions in the chat. Um, so I'll start off with those. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or to raise your hand. Um, so our first question is from Dan Schwartz. What is the nature of the accretion disk in TDs? Thick or thin? Thin disks probably don't support jets. Yeah, so in the case of TDs, the, you know, we think it's more like the slim disk regime, thick disk rather than thin disk, uh, at least when they're at the peak. So the equation rate changes by a lot. So depending on where you're looking at it, um, I would say, but at the peak, it's probably thick disk rather than thin disk. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is from Yvette Sendes. Did you detect any radio emission with ATCA or just not emission that indicated a jet? We just did not detect anything from ATCA, the upper limit. Um, we just had upper limits. So we took uh, radio observations in the, the hard state. We had three observations um, and then we just didn't detect anything. So we had one radio observation here. There's another one here. There was another one here and none of them had any detection. We just had upper limits. Cool, thank you. Um, we have one more question in the chat. Uh, since you have bolometric luminosity and mass, at what Eddington ratio does the state transition occur in the TDE? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I do have, yeah, there it is. The answer is right here. So, so here's the answer. Um, <laughs> So that is the bolometric luminosity over Eddington. Um, so state transition from soft to hard happens over uh, 10 to the minus 1.5 to 10 to the minus one. And then, yeah, the hard to quiescent happens when the accretion rate drops below, yeah, 10 to the minus two. And I believe these are, uh, actually um, consistent with predictions from from this paper which is which is kind of interesting because this paper was done like several years ago and um, it was for you know AGN they were talking about you know if AGN did state transitions how would it look like thank you and sorry I may not have said the name of the previous questioner uh, that was from Angela Riccardi um, thank you uh, next question from floor or I'm sorry, I can't say your last name, Brook Garden, possibly. Um, to what precision can we measure spins or to what redshift approximately? Yeah, so, <clears throat> okay, it's a detailed answer. Um, so you can measure spins with three methods, I think. One is by fitting the slim disk model when the source is in the soft state. This is similar to the continuum fitting of uh, stellar mass black holes. And in this case, at least with 80, 20, 20 OCN, when has been fitting the spectra. And this is the, um, the estimate that he gives me from his modeling. So he models the TD disk to be a slim disk. And one of the parameters in there is the spin of the black hole. And now the second method is using the relativistic iron line method. The best case we have so far is this data, which is not that great. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, hopefully in the future, there will be uh, nicer, uh, sorry, not nicer, but new star observations, which could really you know, pin down the, the nice shape of the, the broad line. 
that could give us um, uh, you know, more precise measurement of the spin. The third method that I've spent a lot of time is using quasi-periodic oscillations, X-ray QPOs, and that can uh, give us constraints, not measure exactly what the spin is, but it can tell us based on like causality argument that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light kind of argument, uh, you know, limits on spins of black holes. Hey, thank um, you. So maybe I've not answered uh, it fully, but we can talk more later. Uh, well, she says thanks in the chat. <laughs> um, so I guess you did. Um, so we do have a hand up, uh, Dan Schwartz. I don't know if that's for your previous question in the chat or if you have another question. Yeah, I actually have another one. It, it strikes me that the uh, hard X-ray emitting coronae are, are very similar uh, in stellar mass and AGN, and yet the uh, accretion disks are maybe two orders of magnitude different temperatures for a billion solar mass uh, black hole. Do you have any thoughts on that or am I misinterpreting? Um, so sorry, what do you mean? Uh, it's different? Well, the hard X-rays from AGN and from uh, stellar binaries are very similar uh, and they're posited oh. to come from a similar hard X-ray emitting coronae. Yeah. Uh, and yet the accretion disks are, are very different. The overall energetics are very different in, in those two systems. Correct. Um, so let me ask, what can uh, tidal disruption events tell us about all this, say? Um, to be honest, I've not thought about it. Um, so. Yeah, it's something I need to think about more. I can't, I can't come up with an answer right now. But, but okay, but thanks. Thing, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I don't know. But one thing is, uh, um, you know, in TDEs, you can actually see the uh, interplay between the disk and the corona in real time. So you can track how the disk is changing and the corona is evolving at the same time. So this can perhaps tell us. Uh, you know, at least address what you're trying to, um, you know, get to. But in the case of AGN, we don't get to see this, right? We don't get to see the corona form or destroy in real time uh, in comparison to the energetics of the disk, for example. Or maybe, right. yeah. Thank you again for a great talk and answering so many questions. If anybody still has questions, um, there are a lot of spots open on the meeting schedule, so please go ahead and sign up. Most of them are for tomorrow, but there's one more left for today. All right. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so moving on to our second talk of the day. Um, our second speaker today is Dr. Dan Wick. He completed his PhD from the University of Virginia studying inverse Compton scattering in galaxy clusters. Uh, after that, he was first a NASA postdoctoral program fellowship and then a research scientist at Goddard, working primarily on New Star. Um, now he is an assistant professor at the University of Utah and chair of the New Star Users Committee. So please, Professor Rick, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to speak to this group. Uh, I gave a seminar something over a year ago, actually touching on this topic, kind of introducing the measurement we wanted to do. Uh, and now it's really great to kind of give, give you some results. Although unfortunately I can't give you um, all, of the, all, all of the results yet um, that we're gonna get out of this, uh, but it'll at least at least be a nice tease uh, of what we can do. Um, feel free, I, I have the chat open, I can see that. I can, I can also see uh, if, if you raise your hand, if, if, if you wanna interrupt, feel free, that's, that's totally fine. So what I'm gonna talk about um, is the cosmic X-ray background, which is just the average emission in X-rays that the universe produces. Uh, and in, in the energy range uh, I'm looking at, uh, it's really it, it's really the uh, probing the accretion history of AGN over over all of cosmic time, um, and so you know one of the big questions I mean you know beyond uh, where do these supermassive black holes come from in the first place how are they seeded 
um, but also is how do they grow over time? And so you can get at this by uh, doing lots of surveys and, and detecting uh, AGN you know, in the X-ray or other, or other wavelengths, uh, and then, and then uh, going after redshifts for the galaxies. Uh, and then you, know, you can create um, uh, you know, a, a picture of how these black holes will accrete over time when are they, they accreting um, uh, the most. So this is a much more coarse measurement uh, where we just, you know, we just point the telescope. Um, actually, we're not pointing the telescope. We just use uh, wherever other people are pointing the telescope, um, you know, in some patch of sky. And then we see what the average X-ray emission is, is coming from, from that, from that entire field. Uh, and then that can be used to, to constrain uh, different AGN populations um, and, and different models or population synthesis models uh, uh, for how those AGN evolve over time. And this will be using NuSTAR, uh, which, is, which is a mission I've been working on for a long time now, uh, and uh, kind of making use of this unique feature uh, where the, uh, the path between the optics, which are here, and the detectors down here in the spacecraft uh, is open. And so we end up getting stray light, which is normally a big pain, uh, but here we're gonna turn into a signal. So just to give a little background on uh, measurements of the cosmic X-ray background, uh, essentially every X-ray mission that goes up um, uh, for decades now has, has some kind of measurement, usually multiple measurements uh, of this background. And this is a nice compilation as of 2013 of all of these measurements. Uh, and um, so one, one thing uh, you can notice is that they all more or less agree, especially on the shape of the CXV. Uh, it looks uh, like a nice consistent picture, which is great, uh, but also these missions don't uh, entirely agree with each other. So for example, these black points here, these are HEO1 measurements. Um, they fall systematically below many other measurements. Uh, which are about 10% higher in flux. Um, and, and in particular, you know, there's, you know, depending on which points you believe, maybe the peak is here, maybe it's a little bit at higher energy. Um, and, uh, you know, the exact shape, um, sort of an absolute measurement of the spectrum really can tell you about, uh, uh, especially the Compton Thick population of AGM and how that um, you know, what fraction of that makes up the total AGN population. So it's crucial to kind of get a nice measurement of this and to also do it um, as accurately and precisely as possible. Uh, this is the energy range uh, of sensitivity with NuSTAR. And what's really nice is that we kind of, you know, where we have this gap uh, between data sets where, you know, there's this variation, it's really due to cross calibration. Um, you know, we can kind of address this. And, you know, maybe we can't, you know, say definitively uh, where it should be, uh, although I would like to make the most definitive possible measurement, at least with NuSTAR and uh, uh, using its unique capabilities. Um, and so just to kind of toot NuSTAR's horn a little bit, uh, uh, there have been uh, measurements where uh, sources are directly detected um, at high energy above 8 keV. And um, uh, as of 2016, this is one of the, the core uh, science pillars of the mission. Uh, the, the cosmic X-ray background had been resolved into point sources uh, up to about 30, 35% uh, of, of its total signal, um, which is you know, consistent. We expect 100% of the emission in this band pass to be due to point sources uh, or, or very close to it. Uh, and, and, then, and then other work as well can uh, look at the types of AGN uh, at, at say different fluxes. And so here, this is, this is the fraction of Compton thick AGN. So these are the AGN that have a lot of gas and dust around them uh, that, that obscure their emission. Uh, and so, you know, you might not uh, even detect, you, you might not detect any X-ray emission at all, say in the Chandra band pass, um, and you would need harder X-rays to detect them or possibly it might even be undetectable uh, with NuSTAR. Um, and then, so this is kind of showing the range of uncertainties. You've got, you know, large uh, error ranges here, different measurements that uh, are, are, are different places. 
Um, so there's just a lot of uncertainty what the actual uh, Compton thick fraction is. And this is kind of an example of how the CXB can help you uh, if we focus on this plot here. Um, uh, so this, this is an example of a population synthesis model where you sort of integrate uh, over, over time um, what, the, what the integrated flux of AGN would be uh, for you know, breaking it down into different amounts of absorption. Um, and so the, the non-Compton uh, thick AGN make up most of the CXP. So these are sources that we can directly detect um, for the most part. But then there's still a Compton thick population that pops up and it sort of makes up this gap. Uh, and if you remember the differences between the different missions, this is a significant, I mean, this is more or less equivalent to that gap. And so, you know, the Compton thick population, its uncertainty, uh, you know, varies widely. Um, uh, so it's really crucial to nail down these measurements. Uh, so how do we do that? Um, so New Star uh, has this open design, and that means that it has extra background components than you would than you would normally like. So, like other X-ray missions, you have cosmic rays that strike uh, the spacecraft, radiate uh, the material there, and then that produces internal lines and continuum um, activation lines and the like. Um, and then, of course, you know you're observing some part of the sky, so you're going to have any source that's in that field. And that's going to include you know, all of the AGN that are in your field of view. So you get this focused component um, uh, of the cosmic X-ray background uh, in your data. But in addition, uh, we also get uh, what I call the aperture CXB, which hopefully that'll be clear in a second. Um, uh, basically, because there's this, uh, be because the telescope's open. Uh, there's sort of a three degree region of the sky um, that the detector is exposed to. Uh, and so all of the AGN within that uh, three degree region uh, can you know, sh shine light directly down. And that actually ends up dominating uh, the X-ray background at low energies, well, low new star energies. Um, and, and in fact, uh, this CXB component is about 10 times brighter uh, than, than the component that is actually focused uh, within your field of view. And that's just because you're looking at a much larger patch of sky. Uh, so how does this work? Um, so if you just consider one source uh, that's, you know, that's off say, you know, two degrees maybe or, or one and a half degrees uh, away uh, from where you're pointed, uh, these, these light rays will come in and they can skirt past the optics bench. Uh, and then go through the aperture stops, which are down here, uh, and then shine down onto the detector. Now, these aperture stops are meant to block exactly this type of radiation uh, uh, emission, um, but they also have to be wide enough so that they don't block the photons that are coming straight down from the mirrors. Uh, and you know, there's there was no way to do both at the same time, so you kind of get stuck uh, with some amount of of the stray light coming in. So this is an example of what that looks like on the detector. Basically, it's a shadow uh, of the aperture stop, of the circular aperture stop uh, in your field of view. Uh, ignore this and, and, and this down here. Those are other unique features of New Star, but they don't concern us here. Um, so what makes this very attractive for trying to do especially an absolute measurement of the CXP is that you don't have to worry about the mirrors and the effective area of the mirrors uh, at all. All you have to worry about is getting the geometry of this stray light uh, uh, correct, how it's, how it's coming in. And that's not so hard because we have uh, sources that are bright. We know uh, what the sources are. We know where we're pointed. And so we can you know, uh, very easily calibrate um, uh, you know, how, how this emission comes in uh, to our detectors. And so we'll, we'll get a mission like that um, uh, throughout. So, you know, using, if we wanted to use the FCXB to measure um, or, or this, you know, the focus component to measure the CXB, we would have to uh, worry a lot about what the, what the calibration of the mirrors were. And New Star's calibration, you know, it involves a spline fit to the effective area and it's, you know, it's normalization is adjusted actually to match other missions. 
So you're not actually going to get at um, a true absolute measurement uh, uh, using that because it's already tied to other missions. Um, but this aperture component, the only thing you have to worry about really is a beryllium window, which sits in front of the detectors. Uh, and, and that's a fairly straightforward um, uh, thing to model. And otherwise it's just, you know, the, the physical size of the pixels on the sky. So if we, if we take sources, and so sources are say coming down this direction, they come down this direction, you know, all, all different directions. And the CXB is, is you know, uniform on the sky um, because the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, that will produce a, partic a particular pattern on the detectors that looks like this. Um, and what's nice is that uh, New Star has two telescopes, which we call FPMA and FPMB, and those shadow patterns, just given the, uh, you know, how the telescope is constructed, end up being different. Um, and, and so this image here, this is showing if you were st standing down at the detector, looking up through the aperture stop, what part of the sky would be visible. So you've got the optics bench, which blocks uh, part of the sky. And then uh, most of the emission that ends up landing on your detector is coming from you know, relatively nearby within a degree, a degree and a half of your field. But, you know, edges of the detector will, will see emission as far away as, as three degrees. Um, uh, but you can, you know, make this, uh, construct a theoretical model for what this pattern looks like. And it very well matches what we, what we actually observe. Okay, so how do we use this to measure the CXB? Well, we've got all of these pointings um, uh, for various reasons, people um, looking at extra galactic AGN, other galaxies, you know, who knows, whatever. Um, we can just take all of that data, stack it together, and make a very nice, precise measurement uh, of this background emission. Uh, and um, so the, the easiest way to go about this, uh, New Star has conducted four surveys, uh, uh, which are given here. And so what we've done is sort of a pilot study for this is we've just taken the data from those four surveys uh, and stack those together and, and look there. And that's nice because uh, they're empty fields. Um, so we don't really have foreground sources we have to worry about so much. Um, and uh, uh, that's the main thing, I guess, really. Um, so, so we've looked at this uh, to see how this idea works. Uh, and this, this is the result. This is what we get out just um, doing that, uh, choosing narrow and relatively narrow energy bands and, and making the measurements. Um, this is in this, this looks different than the previous plots because it's in uh, it's, it's a normal count spectrum. Uh, and, and so the model here that's shown, this is this is the uh, sort of sort of nominal um, CXV model. Uh, so that shape has just been fixed and then the normalization is allowed to be free. Uh, and you can see that there's kind of a deviation here, so a low energies from that. So what is that? Is that real? Has New Star discovered something? Um, uh, and the answer is no. So New Star is in low Earth orbit. Uh, it's orbiting around the Earth and it's taking data. And so it's pointing off here to the to the lower right, say, in, in the plot. And um, you know, it'll go around and some of the time it'll be on the night side of the earth, so it'll be in shadow and sometimes it's in the day. Uh, and when it's in the day, it actually uh, it sees an extra component in the background. Now this is slightly mysterious, how this light actually gets onto the detectors, because we're not pointing at the sun. Um, so it has to be, you know, one way is, is that it can be scattered in um, uh, but there could be other ways uh, uh, that it's getting getting down, and this is a, this is an active area that we're looking into now. How that happens, but we know that it happens, uh, and it has a softer spectrum. So most likely, this is uh, uh, the case here. And so now, if instead of looking, you know, on the sky, uh, since New Star is orbiting around the Earth. If instead of uh, looking at when you know New Star is looking at something, you know, some patch of sky, uh, we only take data when it's looking directly at the Earth or when the Earth is occulting uh, the New Star's field of view, uh, then hopefully we can get uh, uh, maybe an unbiased view 
of what new star sees that's not on the sky. So anything that would have a similar shadow pattern as the CXB, but um, uh, you know, but is not really caused by the CXB. That is just getting confused uh, for whatever reason. Um, and this component here at low energies is definitely the solar component. So this is, this is when we're uh, in sunlight. Um, and, and, and so that, that's very clear. So the, the spatial distribution of the solar component, however it's getting down to the detectors, uh, is, is absolutely uh, being confused with CXB at low energies. Um, well, there's also seen uh, this, this much flatter component that, that extends out in energy. Uh, and I don't know what that is. I, that's, that's something else um, that's definitely uh, uh, under investigation uh, and, and, and to see. Um, it, you know, one possibility is, is some kind of Earth albedo, but the Earth albedo spectrum should be much softer uh, than this component. So it's not, it's not clear to me that that's uh, a good explanation for it. It's empirically seen in the Earth occulted data uh, possibly it's in um, the on-sky data as well, although that's very hard to disentangle. Um, and just to say a few words about the solar component, so we've looked at it um, in, in detail. And so this is just an example of one of these Earth occulted observations um, where data has been stacked, um, where the telescope's either you know, uh, illuminated by the sun or is not. Uh, and you can see this difference and so we can just subtract off um, the part of the background uh, uh, where the sun's in, where, where we don't see the sun, New Star doesn't see the sun. And this is, this is the spectrum that we're left with. And we would really kind of expect, you know, the, this sort of steep shape. So there's a continuum shape there uh, uh, due to the solar mission. Um, and then maybe this is probably related to the sun and, uh, uh, and iron line here, um, possibly in the corona. But then there are other lines uh, that aren't really readily explained. It isn't something that you would expect necessarily to be in the sun. And this in particular is, is a pretty strong uh, titanium line. Um, and that is, uh, that material is found in, in the mast separating the optics and, and uh, detector benches. So most likely you've got some kind of reflection off of that structure, which redirects it back into the, uh, the telescope. So in any case, this is kind of complicated. It's a little tricky uh, uh, to uh, understand. Um, and so the best thing to do is to just, you know, get rid of all of this uh, data that's in the sun and only uh, look at the uh, data when we're in, um, uh, in the shadow. But you know, before we go there, if we, if we take uh, this measured value um, and uh, correct our, or add that model uh, to the CXB model, uh, thanks for your um, this is what we get. Uh, and uh, now, now we have nice agreement um, uh, with what we expect the CXB to look like. So every, everything kind of looks con consistent at this point. Um, the caveat here, though, is, is that, uh, you know, there's, there's still a lot of wiggle room. We've got this extra model, you know, we kind of know what the spectrum looks like, um, but how to scale that occulted model to the, to the data, that's not clear because, you know, the, these two images aren't really um, uh, all the same. Okay, so what we want to do is, is really get at this uh, uh, get at these issues and, and try to eliminate all of these uncertainties. So, and you know, one thing we can do is just add more data. Um, so instead of just focusing on the survey fields, we can focus on all the fields, basically. Every, every field that Neustra has observed. Um, right now we have data processed uh, uh, up to 2018. And this is the work being led by uh, my graduate student, Stephen uh, Rossland. So everything, everything I'm showing is, is his, his work. Uh, and so Steve, has, he's developed an automated pipeline. Uh, I, I won't go into it, but we have you know, 25 megaseconds for a telescope um, of, of reduced data. Uh, it's, it's mostly automated 
uh, this processing. So we do an automated light curve filtering. Um, we identify sources that are in the field, create exclusion regions, um, and then mask um, that, that portion of the data. Uh, uh, but, you know, for now, um, we're, we kind of we, we kind of want to understand what we're doing. So what we're going to do is we're just going to exclude any times that are at night uh, and any fields that don't have any sources in it. So this reduces the total uh, uh, data set to about 10% of what it nominally will be. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you what the CXB spectrum looks like that we measure uh, just to give you a flavor uh, for the statistical power we have. So this is just to reiterate, um, you know, if you select certain missions, you can get a really nice consistent picture of what the shape is, but then you can select some different missions and then you get, uh, you know, the same shape, um, but it's it has a slightly different uh, overall normalization. Um, and so, you know, really what we want to do is distinguish is this correct, is that correct, um, or at least what's New Star's opinion on the matter. Uh, okay, so let's let's see what Newstar uh, uh, tells us. And if I just restrict our measurement to below 10 keV, this is what we see. Um, and uh, this this actually bothers me quite a bit uh, how well it follows uh, the HEO one uh, measurements. Um, uh, that, that's kind of a surprise, but I just want to be very clear that uh, it's still uh, early days and this kind of normalization uh, could potentially change. But, um, you know, this is not, you know, this is applying no fudge factors, just it's the data, we fit it um, in a pretty straightforward way. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just a geometric collecting area. Uh, and it just happens to land right on the HEO one measurements. Now, if we go up to higher energy, uh, then we start seeing uh, some deviations, which is probably telling us, uh, uh, you, know, you know, possibly we still need to work something out in the method, um, but there could also be correlations with instrumental components. If, if instrumental lines vary across the field of view in any way that matches up with the actual data uh, or with the CXB uh, variance, um, then that's going to, uh, uh, you know, potentially bias these measurements. So that's something we have to look into. And then because in the abstract, I promised up to 40 kV, uh, this, despite knowing better, I'll show you what the measurements look like up to 40 kV uh, and they look like this. So there's this, there's this gap here, which I don't know if it's real or not. Um, most likely it's due to systematics of some kind or another. Uh, but then at this point, we're starting to get into just, just a problem of detecting the signal. And just to give you a sense, like we, now we have these measurements that are way up here from 30 to 40 keV. These are almost certainly due to correlations of instrumental lines that just happen to be lined up. And here I'm just showing uh, telescope A. Uh, there's also telescope B and that data, and I'm not showing it because that data is actually being reprocessed as we speak. Um, and, and, and because the shadow pattern is different on B, if there are any systematic differences with, uh, uh, with lines, it's most likely that the correlations will be different. So maybe A does this, but maybe the flux in B will be down here. And that's just telling us uh, the size of our systematic uncertainty and what we can really believe or not. Um, okay, oh, touching the wrong thing. Uh, and then just to finally uh, conclude and, and bring it all home. Uh, so these are, these are again, uh, some of the same measurements shown on the left, um, but also including a more recent lower energy uh, measurement of the CXB from Capaluti 2017. Um, and, uh, and the lines here, these are different models that are you know, less AGN synthesis and more, you know, it's, it's more including a, a UV, uh, uh, in, in, you know, including constraints from the CMB, you know, really, really trying to do a, a, a true evolution of both star forming galaxies um, from very high redshift and including AGN. Um, and so the models all kind of differ by exactly this amount. And if you cherry pick the CXB measurements that you use, uh, you know, that actually has a huge impact on, on this model prediction. Um, and it's just one piece of the whole puzzle. Uh, but this you know, is why it's important 
to, to try to understand this. And then lastly, um, we can also measure cosmic variance, uh, which we did in this recent paper. Um, these three fields here, these are just uh, the same the same field, but taken at three different epochs. So they should all kind of be the same, but you can see that the EGS field is a little fainter. UDS is more consistent with cosmos. Um, and uh, so we can see cosmic variance uh, in these deep survey fields. And the idea is because we're looking at all parts of the sky, um, we can kind of measure cosmic variance as well uh, in the future. So, okay, great. That's all I have uh, and a little over time, but um, happy to take questions. Thank you very much for a great talk. So, so far we have some comments in the chat, not entirely questions as far as I can tell, but if you would like to address them while we're waiting for, yes, yeah, so again, if you have any questions, please raise your hands or put them in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, so I think that's actually a good point about HEO-1. Um, you know, HEO-1 is sort of the only mission that was actually designed to make this measurement. Uh, and I, you know, I've heard people say in the past that maybe there's something you know, to be worried about uh, with the, the HEO-1 measurement. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I don't actually know any of the details uh, behind that measurement, but, you know, given the fact that it, you know, it was designed to do this very thing, you know, I would be, uh, you know, it would be interesting to, well, I, I do kind of trust it in, in a way, um, but, you know, I, it's still early days to know whether like this very nice agreement here at low energies, if that's if that's real or not. Um, I was actually, you know, I was kind of, I was very surprised when it when it worked out this way. I was less surprised about this part happening because um, uh, we're still working out kinks. Um, but down here, I mean, that's that's very interesting. Great, thank you. Um, okay, we have. A question from our first speaker. Um, so cool work. Given that solar activity changes over years time scale, should we also worry about time component of the new star sol solar spectrum um, when including sunshine equals one data? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, so that's right. So uh, the spectrum absolutely changes as a function of solar activity. Um, so early in the mission, we were closer to solar maximum. And uh, uh, there was a clear correlation with with GOES data. Um, you know, when you when you had uh, heightened solar activity, the spectrum uh, not only was it brighter, but it was harder, uh, and so the spectrum changed. Uh, and so, you know, one one part of the procedure uh, of for filtering the data is in, in the light curves. Um, we look at both the soft. Uh, we restrict the, the light curve to a soft energy band and a hard energy band. And in the soft energy band, it's meant to capture uh, any, any, any heightened solar activity uh, and then to remove those periods. So then any, any uh, data in the sunshine that we keep in, uh, uh, in our data set will um, uh, essentially uh, just represents sort of the quiescent uh, uh, solar shape, which which we have a, which we have a good uh, uh, understanding of, um, or or at least uh, empirical constraint on. But that's absolutely right. As you, uh, uh, it's it, it's it's something that um, can definitely be changed. So what we're doing uh, is we're is we're breaking up a lot of the data also by the orientation of new star relative to the sun, and this absolutely affects the spatial shape on the detectors that, that you see. Um, and that's giving us a hint about how the, the emission is getting in to the telescope. Um, so, uh, uh, but there's also a time component as well uh, uh, that we can break the data up by uh, as well. I see in the chat, there's another uh, question. Can you talk about possible explanations for all these different normalizations? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. So ultimately it comes down to absolute calibrations in the X-ray. Uh, they're very difficult. Um, I remember as a grad student, uh, I would think, why can't why can't we calibrate things, uh, you know, um, uh, better? What's what's the holdup here? What's the problem? And then I started trying to do this for uh, uh, for one of my thesis chapters, 
Uh, and then I came away with, how is, how is it ever calibrated uh, at the 10% level? This is a, this is a miracle. Um, and it's just really hard. Uh, part of the reason is that there aren't any you know, steady sources of X-ray emission the crab is, uh, has often used, but it's a pulsar, it's, it has a, a, a wind nebula, and that's varying over long time scales we know now. Um, and so it's just very hard uh, to do that. And, and, um, and, you know, there are just lots of intricacies. We can't go up to the telescope and tweak things. Um, you know, we just have to use data after the fact. And, and, and so, yeah, it's, it, it's really hard. So it ultimately comes down to what the absolute calibration of these different missions are. And, um, uh, and you know, there, uh, you know as, as Garrett can tell you, there, there are issues with Chandra and XMM which have these huge teams um, uh, that, you know, at least at least in the past, probably not true anymore. Um, the, the budget for working on the calibration was more than New Star's entire mission budget, um, at, at least integrated over a few years, uh, maybe some other years. Uh, so this is, you know, it's it's and 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 there's still disagreement between XMM and Chandra. Uh, so it's it's just a very hard problem. Um, uh, and the hope here is that by keeping everything as simple as humanly possible, uh, we can we can make reliable measurements. And we certainly have the statistics, um, which which I believe very much in in these data points here, um, uh, to do it. And and so hopefully we can cut the data in in, in ways that that make the problem as as straightforward as possible. Thank you. Um... We do have one more question. I know we're running over, but I imagine people can drop off if they need to be somewhere else. As long as, Dan, do you have time for more questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, so I think uh, we have a raised hand. Shuri Zhao, I'm really sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, you're right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wick. Very nice talk. Uh, so. Uh, what I understand the precise, I mean, to, you, you did to, pro, uh, to obtain this uh, cosmic X-ray background is you remove the, the, comp the background components from the aperture and the, also the instrument, and then you obtain the, the, the real cosmic X-ray background. And one of the, the instrument background is the focused CXB, I mean, the focused cosmic X-ray mm -hmm. background. Right. So that is a few percent of the total CXB. And uh, I think that should be, have a similar, that should have similar uh, shape of mm -hmm. the total CXB. Did you try to reconstruct, I mean, the, the total CXB by using this FCXB and to see mm -hmm. if they give the consistent result? Yeah, good question. Um, so, uh, so, so what we've done is, is we're essentially assuming that, uh, let's see, where is it here? Um, that the shape on, on the detectors here, this is entirely due to this aperture CXB. So the focus CXB um, actually looks, you know, it should look like the vignetting function of the telescope, but it's actually very flat. So when we're making this measurement, we, we don't, you know, it's not including the focused uh, portion of the CXB that that kind of naturally gets subtracted out, and then also um, uh, it's not it's not super obvious from this this image, but like this detector has a higher uh, uh, instrumental background than the other detectors, and so its flux tends to be uh, always a little bit higher, uh, whatever energy band you're looking at, um, and. Uh, and so that, that when we do these fits, we also include uh, a model for each separate detector or just a normalization, basically, that hopefully accounts for all of these things. Um, uh, but of course, this is an assumption. So you're absolutely right that, uh, you know, uh, we should expect if we're measuring an absolute measurement of, of uh, CXB that, you know, we can figure out what, you know, that. Uh, what this is, um, and uh, we can check to make sure it's consistent. And this this is on the to-do list. So right now, it's assumed that this component's getting you know, not not being included in our measurement at all. So we're we're just kind of ignoring it, along with all, all of the other background components uh, shown here. 
Um, but we've also fit, uh, we can also fat, uh, stack spectra. This is an, exa an early example of that. Um, we have much deeper stack spectra now where we're seeing, you know, for example, here, there are some lines, subtle lines in here uh, that pop out when you stack 20 megaseconds of data um, uh, that we're now including in the model. And, um, and we have to include the FCXB as well as the aperture in here. So you know, you're absolutely right. This is um, you know, making sure everything is self-consistent, both spectrally and spatially uh, is really crucial. Um, uh, and, and, and that's something we're going to do down the line. It's just a met, you know, uh, uh, doing this spatial measurement is sort of the cleanest thing we can do. And we don't have to worry about all the fiddly bits in the other background components. Um, uh, so we're, we're you know, doing, doing that step first. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we've had a lot of discussion today. That's great. Um, there are still a couple spots open on the one-to-one -one meetings um, schedules. So if anybody still wants to talk, please go sign up. Um, a big thank you to both our speakers. So another round of applause, or I guess you can't really hear the applause. Um, <laughs> but here, we'll do this. Um, and thank you all for joining. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.